everyone's fond of saying that coastlines and forest distributions and all this stuff are fractal. Well, doesn't this imply that there is then a global fractal? There is a fractal dimension which when you feed it into your computer and wrap the data around a sphere, the continents and oceans of Earth should appear. And in principle, again to the absurd level, you should be able to then telescope in on that portion of this data that is wrapped around the sphere that corresponds to Northern California. And on your computer screen should appear Esalen hung on the cliffs of Big Sur with us sitting in a room inside discussing the matter. Rupert, Terence, I'm Ralph. Creation, imagination, my mask is chaos. early LSD experiences, I seemed to see uh, motifs and structures that gave me an interest in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And I went to India with the intent of studying the Tibetan language and quickly found that the whole thing was just overwhelming and that I was just, you know, a human atom in the sea of India. And, that the notion of uh, encompassing or understanding what this was was clearly uh, the task of a lifetime. And several times in my life, I have acted out this sort of ricocheting relationship between the humanities and the sciences. At times, you know, losing myself in the study of certain schools of poetry or literature or painting, and then at other times spending years reading philosophy of science and epistemic uh, basis of physics and this sort of thing, always trying to get a resolution on the content of my experience, my lived experience, which included the psychedelic experience, which for me from very early on was this kind of tremendous uh, mystery or conundrum which was set down in the middle of my being. And it still continues like that. I keep returning to that, testing all the ideas against uh, against the fullness of experience. The main difference between our world and the world that science tells us we're living in is that science denies the quirky, freaky, cosmic giggle, high plottedness, completely improbable, totally quirky humor that binds everything together and that makes it something other than an engine in which atoms blindly run, in, in Whitehead's phrase. Schrodinger brilliantly anticipated uh, the discovery of DNA and then Joseph Needham and L.L. L. White and, uh, well, Eric Yonch should be mentioned, actually, as a precursor of us all, I think. I mean, Eric Yonch was a great pioneer, a great soul, and he saw very deeply into whole systems, as did Ilya Prigozhin, the Belgian thermodynamicist. And I think uh, a lot of all of what we're doing comes out of that. What Prigozhin showed that just brought down the house was that 
there could be uh, perturbations of physical systems that were unpredictable and that would cause the whole system to actually move to a more ordered state than the initial state. And this perturbation to higher states of order looks suspiciously like a violation of the uh, supposedly inviolate second law of thermodynamics. So that looks, you know, like a, a doorway into a, an energetic hyperspace. Well, when uh, A New Science of Life came out in 1982 in America, it came out a year earlier in England, um, I came to California because it was published in Los Angeles. I found myself here at Esalen. I found a, an extraordinary new range of things going on I hadn't known about. And when I was in San Francisco, uh, a friend who I knew from Europe said to me, just the day before I left, um, there's somebody you must meet. Uh, he's called Terence McKenna. I didn't know much about <laughs> Terence, uh, so I went up there um, and in this large 1956 Buick, we headed off into the woods in uh, Sonoma County, where Terence lives. And there I met both Terence and Ralph, who was there for the day. I found that uh, part of my interest in these other realms of reality, of course, like many people in this room, was stimulated by experience with psychedelic substances. Um, this was before I went to India. When I arrived in India, I found that India is a kind of psychedelic realm anyway. You know, it's, it's just an amazing place. So in Terence, I found somebody who knew about that whole realm, who shared with me an interest in India, since it played an important part in his development, and who had views about the nature of reality which complemented my own in an extraordinary way. My own theory is about memory and habit in nature. Terence, I found, had developed a theory about novelty and creativity in nature, a theory about the quality of time and the creative process uh, as it uh, is related to the ongoing flux of events. Um, and Ralph uh, had a kind of mathematical theory which was just the kind of thing that the view of nature I was trying to develop needed, the idea of nature being drawn by goals or attractors in the mathematical science of dynamics. There's this uh, model of, the na of reality being pulled from ahead by things called attractors. Um, it's a teleological, animistic view of nature, uh, which dressed up in the guise of mathematical models, um, which I found most fascinating. And so for me, the meeting with Ralph and Terence was a step further towards seeing how one could begin to dream of a world in which nature was seen as alive in which the imagination permeated all reality, in which animals and plants are seen as part of the um, living uh, texture, the living, the living components, the cells in, in the life of Gaia, and Gaia in the life of the cosmos as a whole. In fact, a view of the world uh, as alive, which recalls in some respects the old cosmologies of the ancient world, where the cosmos was seen as a living organism where they thought of the whole cosmos as having a soul, the soul of the world, the, the anima mundi. So I was uh, brought up in a field of music, but I was attracted to mathematics early. And when I was 14, I played in the State Symphony. And after that, I started in mathematics. And I became a professor at Berkeley when I was 23. I had an easy way in mathematics, and the, the way the uh, system works, the carpet is unrolled in front of you. You know, you, can, you have a few choices, but basically before you even know what's happening, the carpet is unrolled, and you've, you're down the runnel into whatever you can do that's useful to the system. In this process, I, I lost uh, nature. But there was a great gain because I love it out there. I love to be off the planet. I always did. And uh, to this day, I spend very little time on planet Earth. So it went on in this way. And by 1967, I was a professor at Princeton. I had written three books on 
mathematics that you need a microscope to read. <laughs> and I had been studying for a long while chaos, but we didn't call it chaos then, and we didn't see in it any role in the natural world or in social transformation or in the evolution of consciousness because we didn't think about anything out there. So one day after my third book was done and I was exhausted and I looked up and all the students were out in the courtyard demonstrating about the Vietnam War and to open the university to women students and, and so on. I said, what exactly is, is going on? Here they said, take this. <laughs> 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 and so, like many people in that year or around that time, in 1967, my uh, career had a bifurcation. So I went off the track with uh, psychedelics, with meditation, but especially with searching, with trying everything, and uh, eventually I was living in a cave in the Himalayas. And when I returned to California, I was standing on a street corner in Santa Cruz, in white pajamas, and a car stopped. An old friend from a previous lifetime said, there's somebody you have to meet, get in the car. <laughs> I had nothing to do, it sounded okay, and in that time, I believed that everything goes perfectly. You just go along with the flow, as they said. I didn't know it would be a two-hour drive, so I got in the car, there was the two-hour drive to Berkeley, and I was literally dumped out of the car on uh, Terence's front step. I never heard of Terence at that time, 1972. Mm -hmm. And I went in, and what happened then, I would still say, although we've had many wonderful talks and exciting, thrilling, and nutritious times in the meanwhile, that that was quite a miraculous chat. Many subjects came up. How to grow mushrooms, outer space, I don't know, anything you could think of, all passed by in the course of an hour or two. In this way, we became friends, and this habit we had, this activity that we do, I mean, we never go for a hike or something like that. We sit in the evening and, and talk, and what happens is synergistic, uh, miraculous growth, evolutionary. And in this uh, revitalization of my work, and eventually the whole field of mathematics, my conversations with Terence, whereas I think we thought of them as just good fun, that they did have a really fundamental influence on everything I've done since. So fun, or I would say fun is insulting. I mean, thrilling uh, because of going to the edge, going beyond the edge, having company there, finding things which you can bring back and they work, and become part of everything you're doing. So it's opened up these complex uh, phenomenon characterized by chaotic irregular, that is to say not well ordered in the previous paradigm of space-time structure. For example, relationships among people, the states and change of states of society, the whole process. The, the intimations of mysticism <clears throat> the intimation of a possibility of transcendence is all firmly grounded. We just have to now, it's almost as though mathematics is the extreme cutting edge of human understanding. How can we quickly export these new understandings that release us from a need for closure, that free us from an either or universe? How can we quickly export these models from the realm of research mathematics into the realm of, uh, of daily life. I really see it as politics, almost at the viral level, that we are trying to create new languages and new concepts, and not only create them, but teach them to you and we ourselves repeat them over and over again and you feed back into this and then we refine the meme and then a meme is like a gene it can be replicated and we have not seen language as the playing field of uh, the creation of the new paradigm but that's really where it is we can transform ourselves no more quickly then we transform our language. And the way we transform our language is by really pushing on the envelope of the act of communication. 
You know, the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland says, say what you mean and mean what you say. I do. I'm a biologist by background. I studied biology because I was interested in animals and plants. And when I was studying it at Cambridge, I began to have terrible doubts about what I was doing because everything that really interested me about animals and plants somehow vanished when I got into the biochemistry laboratories. I was majoring in biochemistry and I did a PhD in biochemistry there. Um, but there's a curious thing about biochemistry. You're doing biochemistry to study the molecular basis of life. Yet the very first thing you do in the laboratory is kill whatever you're studying, grind it up, extract the enzymes, and then in a test tube, study the properties of some of these molecules extracted from this killed organism. And it began to occur to me that perhaps this wasn't the best way to understand life. Um, but I didn't quite know what to do about it because everybody else thought it was definitely was the best way to study life and in fact there was no other valid way. Um, so this set me thinking and I began to see that um, the science of biology could be reformed, uh, that this idea that living organisms are truly alive rather than being just machines, that's the official doctrine, the mechanistic theory says living organisms are just complicated machines. Um, believe it or not, still the official doctrine of academic biology and academic medicine. Uh, these ideas went on developing. I then saw how I could bring them all together in a synthesis and into a new, new way of seeing how biology could be done. And I wrote a book while still in India called A New Science of Life. In it, the basic idea I'm suggesting is that there's a kind of inherent memory in all kinds of animals and plants. Each species has its own collective memory. So each member of the species draws on this collective memory and in turn contributes to it. The instincts of animals, for example, the behavior of cuckoos, the spinning of webs by spiders, are like a memory, a habit of the species. This inheritance takes place by the process I call morphic resonance, by a kind of invisible, intangible memory a kind of resonance between present and past organisms of the same kind. The same theory helps explain how our own memory works by a resonance between our own past and our present states. It leads to the idea that our memories aren't stored in our brains, but that we're tuning into them by this process of morphic resonance. Rupert's notions revision causality. That means induct you into an entirely new way in which things happen. And this is, after all, uh, where we're all spending a lot of our time. Uh, the models that Ralph is working with show that the world is not an engine running down toward a heat death, but a tremendous kaleidoscope of unpredictable, creative, open-ended uh, activity on every level. I mean, it's really a dazzlingly kaleidoscopic vision. It's like a, it's like a, a, a Sufi hierophany or something, but we're seeing it on the screens of computer simulations of this mathematical domain that is also the neural domain, that is also the social domain, that is also the eco-planetary domain. This is not error. This is not uh, mysticism. This is the real facts of how it is how the world fits together. It fits together through the infusion of its invisible soul. If nature is evolutionary, if all of nature is evolving, what about the eternal laws of nature, which scientists have taken for granted for so many centuries? Concepts going right back to Pythagoras and the ancient Greeks. Were all the laws of nature there before the Big Bang? Well, if they were there before the Big Bang, where could they possibly be? There was no where to be, there was no universe. So if the laws of nature were all there before the Big Bang, then they must be idea, non-physical, idea-like entities dwelling in some kind of permanent mathematical mind 
uh, be that thought of as the mind of God or just the mind of a kind of uh, disembodied mathematician. Um, they, they were thought to be permanent and all there before the universe. This assumption is still held by most of our modern cosmologists. It's something that physicists have not yet begun to question seriously. But as you can see, it's like an idea that's had the, the carpet taken from under it. It's sort of hanging over an abyss um, because there's no real reason why we should assume the laws of nature are permanent in an evolving universe. If the universe is evolving, then the laws of nature could be evolving as well. And in fact, the very idea of the laws of nature may not be appropriate. It may be better to think of the habits of nature evolving. The Big Bang is like the cracking of the cosmic egg. That's its mythological co correlate, the notion of the ancient mythological idea of the cosmos beginning through the hatching or the cracking of an egg, followed by the growth of the organism that comes out. It's an embryological metaphor. Um, and we now have a, a kind of developmental model of the whole universe. It's like a developing organism. It's not like a machine at all anymore. The universe is a growing, developing organism, which is differentiating within itself, forming new forms and patterns, an evolutionary process that on Earth has given rise to all the forms of animal and plant life, all the different kinds of microbes, to ourselves and to the many and varied forms of human culture. A theory of evolutionary habits demands a theory of evolutionary creativity. How can we understand the creativity that's given rise to new ideas, to Beethoven's symphonies, to uh, theories in science, to new works of art, to new forms of culture, to instincts in birds and animals, um, to the forms of flowers and plants and leaves, to the many kinds of rocks and crystals, and to all the forms of galactic and stellar and planetary organization? What kind of creativity could underlie all those processes? One is the materialist view that says the whole thing is entirely due to blind chance, that there's nothing but a kind of darkness of blind material processes going on, and then by blind chance, new things happen. The other model for understanding creativity, I think, is provided by our own imaginations. Our imaginations are not full of fixed platonic ideas, which are always the same, like platonic minds. They're ongoing, changing, dynamical processes with a kind of creative richness that always surprises us. So the question is, if nature is alive rather than dead, if the universe, if the Earth, have a kind of mind or soul of their own, if living organisms are in some sense uh, mind-like, or if there's a mind-like process at work in nature, then how does this express its creativity? And so the, then the question is, could this creativity in nature be a product of the imagination of Gaia, of the Gaian mind? Could it be a product of the cosmic imagination? Could there be a kind of imagination working in nature, uh, which is similar to our own imaginations? Um, could our own imaginations be just one conscious aspect of an imagination working through the whole nat natural world, perhaps unconsciously as it works underneath the surface of our dreams, perhaps sometimes consciously? And could this ongoing imagination be the basis of evolutionary creativity in nature, just as it is uh, in the human realm? How would it be, or is it credible, that perhaps what the universe is, is a kind of system in which more advanced forms of order actually influence previous states of organization? This is what is emerging in Ralph Abraham's work with the uh, chaotic attractors. They are attractors. That means that they exert influence on less organized states and pull them toward some kind of end state. And for me, the key to unlocking what is going on with history, creativity, progressive uh, process of all sorts is to place uh, the state of completion at the end but to see it as a kind of 
higher dimensional object which casts an enormous and flickering shadow over the lower dimensions of organization of which this universe is one. So that, for instance, in the human domain, when we look at history, what we see is an endless series of anticipations. The golden age is coming. The Messiah is immediately around the corner. Great change is soon to be upon us. These are intimations of change. It's almost as though the transcendental object that is the great attractor in many, many dimensions uh, throws out images of itself which filter down through these lower dimensional matrices and actually are the basis of the appetition of nature for greater expression of form, the appetition of the human soul for greater immersion in beauty, the appetition of human history for greater expression of complexity. So um, when I think about these terms, chaos, creativity, imagination, I see them, it's like a three-stroke engine of some sort. Each impels and runs the other and sets up uh, a reinforcing cycle that then stabilizes uh, organisms, processes that are caught up in this in the phenomenon of being. The phenomenon of being is this self-synergizing engine of a, out of chaos, through creativity, into the imagination, back into chaos, out into creativity, uh, so forth and so on. And it operates on many levels simultaneously so that the planet is undergoing a destiny. Deep time, the time of geology, was only really discovered around the turn of this century. And it is cosmically uh, ennobling to, to think of the universe as a thing of great age, but I think that it's time to put in place, next to the notion of deep cosmic time, the notion of chaotic, uh, sudden uh, change, cusp flux, and sudden perturbation. Because at the, what deep time has revealed as we've pushed our understanding of the career of organic life back 65 million years, 270 million years, what we see is tremendous punctuation built into the universe in the case of the Earth in the form of asteroidal impacts. This thing which happened 65 million years ago, nothing larger than a chicken walked away from it on this planet. So it, there's a strange paradox where <laughs> taking deep time seriously, the message of deep time is you may not have as much time as you thought, that the universe is dynamic, capable of turning sudden corners. So then the imagination becomes a kind of beacon. The imagination is, as it were, a scout sent ahead or a, a, uh, something which has preceded us into history and in fact is a kind of eschatological object. It is shedding uh, influence, the morphogenetic field if you wish. If the morphogenetic field is not subject to the inverse square law of decreased influence over distance, then I, as a layman, don't see why, Rupert, we couldn't uh, locate it at the conclusion of process. Because, you know, one of the things that's always puzzled me about the Big Bang is uh, it's a singularity. This is the term physicists use for it. This means theory cannot predict it and yet it is necessary to make everything which follows from it happen. 
So you just say, you know, there's no reason for this, we have no argument for this, but the rest of the theory needs it, so it's a singularity. And the immense improbability which modern science rests on but cares not to discuss is this, the belief that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment. Well, if you can make that leap, to believe that, <laughs> it's very hard to see what you couldn't believe. That is almost the limiting case of credulity, I would think, you know? So, um, <laughs> so in order to save the phenomenon, I would propose a different idea that, uh, and it, I think it is eminently reasonable, and it is that as the complexity of a system increases, so too does the likelihood of its generating a singularity or an unpredictable perturbation. So the, the pre-existent state of the universe, I imagine to be extremely simple, an unflawed nothingness. In other words, the least likely situation in which you would expect a singularity to emerge. But now let's look at the other end of the historical continuum of the history of the universe. Uh, let's look at the uh, world we are living in, which is full of uh, 106 elements, tremendous gradients of energy ranging from the, what's going on inside pulsars and quasars to what is going on inside viruses and cells, tremendous organizational capacity at the atomic level, at the molecular level, at the level of molecular polymerization, at the level of membranes and gels, at the level of uh, cells and organelles, organisms, societies, uh, so forth and so on. In other words, the universe at this moment is a tremendously complicated, integrated, multi-leveled, dynamic thing. And every passing moment, it becomes more so. This is what evolution, history, compression of time, what all these things are attempting to indicate is the increasing complexity of reality. If a singularity is necessary to explain this universe, that singularity must emerge rather near the end of the complexification process rather than its beginning. You see, we simply have to reverse our preconceptions about the flow of cause and effect, and then we get a great attractor that pulls all organization and structure toward itself over several billion years. And as uh, the objects of its attraction uh, grow closer to its proximity, they somehow interpenetrate uh, they set up uh, standing wave patterns of interference. New properties become emergent, and the entire thing complexifies. Well, to my mind, this is um, uh, the divine imagination. This is what Blake called it. This is the only way I can conceive of it. Time is the theater of God's becoming, but it's also, from the point of view of a higher dimensional manifold, a kind of fit accompli. And this is no contradiction, or if it is, it's all right, because in these realms of higher ontology, you're always asked to avoid closure and hold the notion of a coincidencia positorum, a union of opposites. The thing is both what it is and what it is not, and yet it somehow escapes contradiction, and that's how uh, the open system is maintained. That's how uh, the miracle of uh, life is possible. So I sort of think of the divine imagination as uh, 
the, the class of all things both possible and beautiful. It's a kind of reverse Platonism. The attractor is at the bottom of a very deep pit into which all phenomena is uh, cascading. What is taught in modern universities these days is that these tracks in the snow are going nowhere. The technical term is trendlessly fluctuating. And we're told that history <laughs> is this kind of process. It's trendlessly fluctuating. It goes here, it goes there. It's called a random walk in information theory. It means you just wander around and, well, it's very interesting. Now we begin to see through the marvel of, uh, of the new mathematics that random walks are not random at all, that a sufficiently long random walk becomes a fractal structure of extraordinary depth and beauty. So you see, really what has to happen is for us to see chaos not as something that degrades information and is somehow the enemy of order, but rather chaos is the birthplace of order. Chaos is not the problem, chaos is uh, the answer. I think a, a, a factor which changes everything is the discovery of dark matter, the fact that 90 to 95, 99% of the matter in the universe is utterly unknown to us. Uh, this recent discovery effectively tells us that the whole cosmos and every material thing in it has a kind of unconscious, a material unconscious, an unknown dark realm which cut, conditions everything that happens, the shapes of the galaxies, their interactions. Is Gaia, as it were, awake on the side that's in the sunlight and in the side that's in the darkness as it rotates, dreaming? At night, are the plants, the animals, the, the whole ecosystems, the oceans, in some sense, in the dream state when dreams and spontaneous images of what might be possible uh, come to them? So is there a kind of Gaian dreaming and does it happen on the night side of the planet? What would the Gaian mind feel like? What, what form would a Gaian dream take? Or what form would a Gaian psychedelic experience take? The psychedelic experience, it's preposterous to attempt to analyze it in terms of human motivation at its intense levels. It seems rather to be an ontological reality of its own that the human being has simply privil been privileged to briefly observe but it says no more, your psychedelic, ex your deep psychedelic experiences say no more about your personality than that the continent of Africa is making a statement about your personality. They are in fact independent uh, objects. Uh, to my mind, the divine imagination or the imagination is this the source of all creativity in our dreams, in our psychedelic experiences, in the jungles, in the currents of the ocean, in the organization of protozoan and microbial life. Wherever there is large-scale integration, rather than simply raw physics, but integration of laws of physics, integration of properties of membranes and electrophoresis and this sort of thing, it is the creative principle. So do you think then that in psychedelic experiences you're actually tapping into, tuning into, or experiencing something of the Gaian or the cosmic imagination? Absolutely. And I think that, it, that psychedelic experiences and dreams are only different in degree, that they are chemical cousins somehow. And this is why I could see human history as a Gaian dream because I think every night when you descend into dream, you are potentially open to receiving Gaian corrective tuning of your life state. You, uh, the, the whole thing is an enzyme-driven process. We are like an organ of Gaia. We are the uh, organ which binds and releases energy 
for reason. I mean, a liver cell doesn't need to understand why it binds and releases enzymes of the liver. We bind and release energy for reasons perhaps never to be clear to us, but which place us firmly within the context of, uh, of the guy in mind. We have been chosen out, and this is not something to have great hubris about. I mean, indolacetic acid has been chosen out in plant metabolism to play certain roles. We have a role, but our role seems to be a major one. We are like a triggering system out of the general background of evolutionary processes mediated by incoming radiation to the surface of the earth and then natural selection, suddenly we come with an epigenetic capability. We write books, tell stories, dance, sing, carve, paint. These are not genetic processes. These are epigenetic processes. And they bind information and express the guy in mind uh, very well as an example of how willing I am to introduce or to entertain this idea concretely. I've been talking to a lot of people about ecological crisis and the fate of the world and this sort of thing. Well, imagine in hindsight the wisdom that we would impute to Gaia if we were to suddenly realize that what is happening on this planet is that nature knows that the sun is going to explode. And what we are is a kind of response to the anticipation of a wounding that 50,000, 5 million years ago, the geo-heliocentric relationships began to vibrate out of tune. And um, as a consequence of this, a species was called forth that could organize an escape. And we are it. In other words, we are in a divine play. Uh, in line with this, and what made me even entertain these ideas, is I had a very bizarre experience recently. I was in Hawaii, and uh, in our botanical garden, there is a very large dead tree. And one limb of this tree sticks far out over the, over the land. And, uh, Banisteriopsis capi, a large hallucinogenic South American vine, is planted at the, at the bottom of this tree. And uh, it just has swarmed up this tree and covered it with greenery. But it wouldn't go out onto this one limb that stuck out. And I, it bothered my sense of symmetry that this vine would not completely cover this tree. And I even thought about trying to climb up into the tree and thread it out onto this limb to get it to do what I wanted. So I was sitting looking at this tree and this situation and actually thinking about it. And suddenly the limb fell. <laughs> it broke off. And then I thought, and I thought, the vine sensed that it was in unstable. It would not invade this domain that it sensed was structurally unstable. Well, then I said to myself, but how could it? What is the mechanism of this sensing of instability? And a, a friend of mine said, well, perhaps the wind impacts on weakened wood differently than on unrotted wood, and perhaps rhythms in the tree tell it to stay away from it. And then I realized if one plant has that kind of sensitivity to the entering into a domain of danger, what must the ecosystem of this planet be doing in reaction to what we are doing to the planet? So it, I, I see, uh, the reason this relates to the imagination is because I see uh, ourselves in communication <laughs> with the imagination. It is sending images back into the past to try and direct us away from areas of instability. It really is 
the Gaian mind is a real mind, its messages are real messages, and our task through discipline, psychedelics, attention to detail, whatever we have going, is to try and extract this message and eliminate ourselves from the message so that we then can see the face of the other. And this is the field of chaos. For a certain setting of the parameter, form will emerge out of the field of chaos. And where this happens uh, reliably, we've explored the ocean all over and we found a few favorite regions. And they're called the Apache Rift, the Calico Mountain, and the Scroll Reef. So the submarine is dragging along at a thousand iterations depth in the ocean of chaos. Comes across these regular patterns. This is the first wing of the uh, Apache Valley. This is Apache Valley. Um, I think so. Then we've got another field of chaos. Mountain. See, these are just snapshots of different starting positions, if you like. Later on, we drill a deep hole in this area and all the other interesting areas. Why does it have this quaternary structure? That is the question. This is a scroll reef. Now, it's a little presumptuous to call this chaos theory because, as a matter of fact, there is no theory. We're in the exploration phase now, and this is experimental mathematics that we, we are doing with supercomputers. This video was made out of these simplest possible dynamical systems called the logistic equation. And it just produces a series. It's very similar to a dripping faucet. So you could just as well imagine that we have 16,000 dripping faucets in an array of 128 by 128. And the time between drops is represented as a color on the screen. Now, do you think that if you had 16,000 dripping faucets, you could get out of them a pattern like Calico Mountain? It relates to waterfalls, for example, when the spray comes off the waterfall. And here's another example of a chaotic system. Could you write some equations and obtain a computer program that simulated the spray from a waterfall? I doubt it. And from this totally chaotic data, viewed in this particular way, which is called chaoscopy, we get these points in the planes that if the data was really random, the dots would be all over the plane. Instead, they lie on a curve, a smooth curve. And that is called the chaotic attractor. Well, it happens. I mean, it's, there's a lot of theory behind this, enough to suggest that it's not some kind of artifact. No matter what kind of artifact it is, it's an interesting artifact. And I guess I'd like to call this a mathematical law. It has to do with the emergence of form from a field of chaos. We don't know what else to call it. It's not a mathematical law that was known to Pythagoras. And I don't know if it was always there since the beginning of time, long before the Big Bang, or if it just emerged into the evolving field of the guy in mind through the fact that computers make it visible. I mean, I don't know, but the theory can tell you certain transformations you'll expect and others not. For example, Terence had pointed to the punctual aspect of evolution, that many transformations are saltatory, they are catastrophic, they are abrupt as, for example, in the emergence of form, as, for example, in the Neolithic Revolution, as, for example, in the crystallization of the planets. As the temperature drops in the developing universe, according to standard models, more and more form comes into being. First you get uh, atoms, then stars and galaxies condense, then you get solar systems, and through the cooling of matter you can get planets. The, Planets are the cooled remnants of exploding stars. The elements in our us and in our planets are stardust formed from supernovae. One way of looking at this 
is to see the expansion and cooling process and indeed the flow of events as being thinking of it in terms of the flux of energy and one of the great unifying concepts of 19th century physics is a unified conception of energy now it's not entirely clear what energy is energy in some sense is the principle of change the more there is the more change that can be brought about it's in a, in a sense a causative principle um, and it's a causative principle which exists in a process in this process the energetic flux of the universe underlies time, change, becoming, and uh, the, the flux process itself seems to have an inherent indeterminism to it. This flux process, the universal flux, is organized into forms by fields. Matter is now thought of as energy bound within fields, the quantum matter fields and the fields of molecules and so on. I think there are many of these organizing fields, the morphic fields, and nature is the uh, theater of these habitual fields organizing the indeterminate flux of energy. And the fields themselves, by having this energy within them, have this indeterminate quality too. So even organized systems of a high level of complexity still have this probabilistic quality. The fields that organize this energy to give rise to material and physical forms um, are themselves probabilistic. Chaos is never eliminated. There's always this indeterminism or spontaneity at all levels of organization. So there's a formative principle, which is the fields, and there's an energetic principle, um, which I think has the chaos inherent in it. It's a kind of change, which left as pure change would be chaos. One way of thinking of these is in terms of the Indian notion of, sh of Shakti as the energy indeterminate principle and Shiva as the formative principle, working together in a kind of tantric union to give the world that we know. All creation begins in chaos, progresses in chaos, and ends in chaos. And in uh, Hesiod, this word chaos appears in a piece called Theogony, which is a theogony, that is to say, more or less a creation tale, but the stories of the creation of the gods and goddesses one by one. Well, they're not gods and goddesses, really. They're abstract principles. And the three main ones are chaos, Gaia, and Eros. And they're the most abstract, earliest proto-concepts of sky, earth, and the creative tension in between. Now, the meaning of chaos, the first time the word appeared in literature, has got nothing whatsoever, apparently, superficially, to do with what we mean by chaos in the English language and in ordinary life. It meant only to Hesiod, according to the lexicon, the gaping void left uh, the gaping void, uh, sort of the gaping void between heaven and earth out of which the creation came. The creation out of chaos, yes. But the chaos did not mean disorder or anything negative. It only meant this gaping void. Well, after understanding that, you look up, you, th you think of these different interpretations, sky, God concept, uh, the gap and the opening and so on. When you look at the sky, the most obvious chief characteristic feature of the sky is the Milky Way. And it does appear to, as a kind of a gap between this and that, the royal road of the gods traveling between the underworld and the overworld. Understanding that, you can then connect the word with an earlier word, concept, or god or goddess, meaning the same thing as what you visually see represented in the Milky Way itself, and that is in one of its uh, most popular representations, Tiamat, the goddess of chaos from Enuma Elish, the uh, creation poem, the greatest epic poem of Babylonian literature, discovered in the library of Ashurbani Pal at Nineveh. Recent discovery. There was this story of the origin of the gods and the creation of the world by Tiamat and Apsu, the god and goddess of chaos who lived in the water, one more sweet water and the other salt water. And they created then the whole pantheon and the whole world and so on. But eventually along came 
Marduk. Uh, Marduk was a younger generation of gods in the next generation. And there was a conflict between the older and the younger gods over how the world ought to be run. And apparently this conflict was taking place in the form of a social transformation, a transformation represented in the mythological by the demotion of Apsu and Tiamat from the pantheon of Babylon, the city Babylon, and the replacement by Marduk eventually became the god, Mr. Big of Babylon, around 2000 BC, coinciding with the sweep of patriarchy over that city, propelled on a new type of war chariot with spoked wheels instead of solid wheels. Am I digressing too much? No, you've reached the wheel. <laughs> well, I've reached the spoke wheel, and its association with, uh, is this accidental? I don't know, with the patriarchy. And the fact that the wheel itself, as a mathematical model, is the paradigm of order, a divine mathematical form, according to Plato, as the planets were supposed to uh, move before uh, Kepler, who introduced the ellipse, fantastic transformation, uh, punctual catastrophe in the history of consciousness. In short, according to this epic, Enuma Elish, Tiamat was killed in the most violent way, ripped to pieces, creating the world, creating a new order by our hero of Babylon, Mr. Marduk, also Bell, Bao, and so on. His New Year's celebration was um, honored at the New Year time all over old Europe, including at Stonehenge. At the New Year's festival, this epic poem was read. So annually was the reminder that chaos is bad, chaos has been killed, chaos has been replaced by order, an order associated with perfect periodic uh, the wheel, the cycle, the perfect roundness, and, and so on. Whereas in Minoan Crete, you find, according to the evidence of the excavators and all who have examined the artworks that remain, a long-lasting fluorescence of partnership culture with uh, no domination by a male god. It's established that there's the diffusion from Crete to Greece. And the last remainder of Cretan culture, which is a very interesting one, it must have been sort of the, the last vestige of the Garden of Eden. We're talking about the tremendous happiness and uh, uh, fluorescence of beauty in all aspects of, of life. The importance of uh, the chaos revolution now is that chaos has recovered from being demoted, from being banished to the unconscious in uh, around 2000 BC or so, from then up to now four or maybe 5,000 years of the repression of chaos. I mean, ca chaos is to this day in our culture a bad word. We have to watch out for chaos. It ruins your love life. It has to be replaced by order. Scientists most especially hate it and so on. The fact that scientists of all people in the <coughs> temple of science that Tiamat has to be accepted as a friend and replaced upon her throne. This is big news. I believe that the importance of the psychedelics is primary here, and that it doesn't simply have to do with the fact that they synergize cognition, which they do do, and, and the synthetics as well as the natural ones. But it's deeper than that. It's that we have a secret history, knowledge of which has been lost to us and only is now recoverable in the light of the kind of mindset that becomes possible to us if we accept the new paradigm. And what this secret history is and has to do with and how it relates to the Gaian mind and the world soul is that we, we are uh, the victims of a, an, a 
instance of traumatic abuse in childhood as a species because a symbiotic relationship with the world girdling intelligence of the planet which was mediated through plants through shamanism i mean it wasn't an abstraction it was an experience was uh, eventually broken up and disrupted by uh, progressive climatic uh, drying of uh, the Eurasian and African landmass. And so this is literally the fall into history, the expulsion from Eden. All these primary myths of a golden age found and lost have to do with the fact that once we lived in dynamic balance with nature, not as animals do, but as human beings only could, but in a way that we have now lost. Well, what, how have we lost it and what have we lost? How we have lost it is uh, the, the way in which these psychoactive compounds that were being brought into the diet were acting is they were psycholytic upon the formation of the ego. They literally suppressed the formulation of the e the formation of the ego and promoted instead collectivist tribal partnership values which were operating intuitionally in a resonance relationship with the, the feminine vegetable matrix of the planet. In other words, nothing was verbalized, everything was felt, everything was intuited. And regularly at the new and full moon, these small groups of hunter-gatherers, later pastoralists, gathered and uh, took these hallucinogenic plants and dissolved boundaries and engaged in group sex and annealed, a new word that we've brought in here, annealed the irregularities that had cropped up in people's personal self-imaging in the interval since the last <coughs> session. And this kept everything uh, grounded on the plane of that which is important, i.e. the values of the group, of the species, of dynamic balance with the ecosystem, and so forth and so on. Well, when this was disrupted, and the supplies of these plants were diminished, and new religious forms arose, and the time between the great festivals grew longer and longer, uh, the ego begins to take hold first as a kind of cancerous aberration, but then quickly becoming a new style of behavior, which quickly then eliminates all other styles of behavior by suppressing access to the chaos. And this is the point I want to make, that there is between the ego and, and full understanding of reality a barrier, a problem. The fear of the ego to surrender to the fact of chaos. Chaos is what we have lost touch with. This is why it has been given a bad name, because it is feared by the dominant archetype of our world, which is the ego, which clenches, because its existence is uh, defined in terms of control. And the, the furious modeling process, and this will now sound like a knock on modeling, the furious modeling process that the ego endlessly carries out is an effort to fight the absence of closure. The ego wants closure. It wants a complete explanation. The beginning of wisdom, I believe, is the ability to accept an inherent messiness in your explanation of what's going on. Because nowhere is it writ that human minds should be able to give a full accounting of creation in all dimensions and on all levels. You know, Wittgenstein had this idea that philosophy should be what he called true enough. 
And, and I think that's a great idea. Let's just make it true enough, because that's as true as it can uh, be gotten. Well, so uh, the imagination is chaos. New forms are fetched out of this chaos. For me, the creative act is the letting down of the net of human imagination into the ocean of chaos on which we are suspended and the attempt to bring out of it ideas, to bring out of it, uh, you know, sometimes, and this is part, this is my model for the psychedelic experience, that it is the night sea journey, that it is the lone fisherman on a tropical sea with his nets and you let these nets down and uh, sometimes something tears through them that leaves them in shreds and you just row for shore and put your head under your bed and pray. And at other times, what slips through are the, the minutiae, the minnows of this ichthyological metaphor of idea chasing. And, but sometimes, you know, you actually can bring home something that is food, that is food for the human community that we can sustain ourselves on and go forward. So we haven't talked that much about art and aesthetics, but I think in the human world, uh, the, the, uh, the appetition is for beauty to my mind, and this is another place where the Platonism shines radiantly through, you know, because Plato held that the good was the true and that both were the beautiful. And this is a very quaint idea from the point of view of modern philosophy. But I think, uh, you know, it's in the bones when you actually connect yourself up uh, to the planet that's why chaos is capable of being the tremendous repository of uh, ordered beauty that it is, because there, there is no chaos in the old definition, that, which is to say that which by any definition or any test is found to be disordered. That is just a kind of... Uh, of uh, a, a hell notion, a kind of hypostatization of an ultimate state of disorder. But nowhere in, in the world that is deployed through space and time do you encounter that. Instead, what you encounter is embedded order upon embedded order, this fractal, uh, this fractal thing. And then finally, uh, for me, the imagination is the goal of history. I see culture as an effort to uh, re- literally realize our collective dreams. And you know, it's on a very crude level when it's you make your mask and I make my mask and then we dance around together. And it's even at a very crude level when it's you design your shopping mall and I'll design my World Trade Center and we'll put them on the same piece of real estate. But we're coming now into, through media, I believe, through virtual reality and human-machine integration and this kind of thing, into a a situation where the imagination is going to be something that we uh, can share, that the path of mind through its own meanderings will become something that can be recorded and played back. We will have the possibility of living in our own past or uh, you know, creating and trading realities as art. And art, a- as life lived in the imagination, is the great archetype which rears itself up at the end of history. Life in the imagination. The imagination is this auric field which surrounds the transcendental object at greater and greater depth as you approach the transcendental object. And as we now close distance with it, all, uh, all of uh, our, our cultural expression, 
all of our self-awareness is taking on this curiously designed quality. I mean, you must have noticed this, that the world is very heavily designed in a way that it never was before. Uh, morphogenetic fields of great size and scope, which are international schools of architecture and design, touch whole continents. Entire cities are given certain uh, ambiances. This is the summoning of the imagination into the human scale. It's like a god that we wish to call down and draw to earth. I mean, this is why William Blake called it the divine imagination, because it is the four-gated city. It is the flying saucer. We are on a journey to meet uh, this great attractor, and as we close distance with it, it is more and more a multifaceted mirror of our images of beauty. So it's like an ascending learning curve that becomes so asymptotic. And at that point, you're face to face with uh, a mystery, a living mystery that is within each and all of us. It's the imagination that argues for the divine spark uh, in human beings. It's absolutely confounding if you try to uh, get biology to produce it for you as a necessary quantity. It isn't that. It's a, an emanation from above. It is literally a, uh, a descent of the world soul into all of us. We then become the atoms of the world soul, and our channel to it is by closing our eyes and obliterating our immediate personalized space-time locus and falling into the imagination, which is running like a river through all of us uh, endlessly, driven by the, you know, the hy hydraulic momentum of the cataracts of chaos, which usher into the creativity of the imagination. I mean, these river metaphors are, are just endlessly applicable to this. The flowing of forces over landscapes, the pressure of chaos on the imagination to create creativity, and it's looping back into the same. I mean, these, uh, these things are the icons for the world that uh, wants to be that the key is surrender and dissolution of boundaries, dissolution of the ego, and a trust in uh, the love of the goddess, which transcends rational understanding. There will come a moment which will be an absolute leap into space, and we will simply have to have the faith that there is something waiting there, because the dominator style has uh, left us no choice.